second session today is about machine learning in the stock market. We have a pretty fantastic paper, um, and we always heard the first one. Alejandro Lopez Lira from the University of Florida, who present textual analysis of short seller research reports, stock prices, and investment. So, 24 minutes. That's the picture. Yeah, and the clicker is, oh, awesome. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, thank you very much for organizing and inviting me. I always uh, really like uh, this conference and to be in Stockholm. Uh, if you cannot li listen to me on the back, I I'll be happy to use the mic. Otherwise, I think we'll avoid any. Okay. Um, so this is a uh, joint work with uh, Xiao and uh, Jules. Jules was supposed to present, but he had personal issues, so he couldn't come. Uh, Xiao is looking for a job, so. Um, <laughs> OK, sorry. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about the short seller research reports. So short seller research is basically companies that produce some information, uh, post it publicly, and make money out of it. How do they make money out of it? Because they have short, seller, short, uh, short positions on the stock, right? So the idea is like, you know, I'm going to investigate a company. I'm going to see that they are doing fraud. I'm going to put some short positions on the company, and then I'm going to publish the information. And hopefully everyone will realize that the company sucks and you know I get like a whatever return on investment. Um, when we spoke uh, with the, with a couple of um, professionals on this, they told us that you know their target is when they publish a report, they want to see the stock going down 40 percent or something like that. In practice, it depends on the quality of the research, it depends on the quality of the firm and we have we find uh, mixed effects. So these are institutions so such as Citron, uh, Muddy Waters, among others um, and we're going to focus a little bit more on the effect on firm real activities and return expectations. So some work on this has been done regarding the stock price. So the, there is nothing that surprising about the short-term stock price. Like, you know, you publish a report, there's a big decline, right? What we're going to do is we're going to try to focus a little bit on the longer term and what's happening to the companies, real activities, what's happening to expectations about these cash flows, what's happening to the uh, discount rates on this. Yeah. Uh, so just super main findings in case I short, uh, I run, uh, short on time. So firms are going to allocate a big percentage of the reports discussing uh, accounting fraud or earnings mismanagement. So that's going to be a typical report. Uh, there will be a substantial decline in the realized return following the rep uh, the realized return following the publication. And uh, the funny thing that's going to happen is that analysts are not going to update their expectations about cash flows. So they're going to be overly optimistic for the company for a while. So things are going to look as if the expected returns are very high, which is a very funny, funny scenario. Uh, so cash flow expectations remain relatively stable, uh, but the discount rate will increase dramatically as a consequence. I'm just going to show you a little bit there. And then each report is associated with average reduction of corporate investment to 118 million and stock issuance uh, for like 180 million. So like you know, these have like big, big impact on average, of course. Um, and something funny that we find is that. If you compare those companies that commit accounting fraud but do not have like short sold reports associated with them, like no one is publicly like bashing them, we do not observe like uh, those large effects. Yeah. So let me just speak a little bit about the data. So you know, stock is like CRISPR, IBS database for analyst earnings and price forecast. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go to the universe of all the short seller research firms that we could find that post publicly. And then we're going to web scrap and manually download and try to match those to accomplish that. Uh, that's a lot of work. And um, that's a little bit where we're stuck in the data part regarding the text analysis. Uh, we also have going to have like investor attention, SEC download data, Google searches, and Factiva news, uh, although that's not a big part of the paper. Uh, there's a lot of uh, related literature, so short seller research, cash from activism, short selling. Real effects on the stock market for uh, you know time purposes I will not allocate, but we're building on a lot of work uh, in this area. So I just want to walk you through a particular example that I, I, I found very curious. So on September 10, 2020, uh, Hidemog researched about that Nikola. I don't know if you're familiar with Nikola. It's kind of like the competition of Tesla, the electric company. Nikola produces like trucks, right? Um, so Nikola released a video where the truck was like, you know, going on the highway and everything looked fantastic. And then these guys got a tip from someone like, you know, actually they didn't have the technology for the truck. It wasn't driving. What they did is like they put it on the top of a hill and then they just put it on neutral and it was just like <laughs> sliding like down. Um, 
So uh, that, that was like, okay, so, you know, like companies will do like this kind of songs. Like obviously there was nothing illegal about it, but it's uh, kind of like mi misleading. Um, right. So this is roughly the way a report would look. I do not expect you to read the fine letter, but you know, as Nicola, how to parlay a notion of lies into a partnership or, or something like that. They usually, ha they usually have like very uh, um, exotic language. And you know, today we really why Nikola is an intricate fraud built on dozens of lies over the course of its founders. Like this is just a typical report, and lots of them are going to be like that, right? And then they, this report will be like ten pages out of it, just describing the whole situation and describing why they think the company is mismanaged or fraud or etc. Right? What ended up happening is that well, Nikola has mentioned a statement saying that the article contained false and misleading statements, right? Like they immediately like almost sued them. And then like 10 days afterwards, the founder just voluntarily stepped down uh, on it, right? And then in a regular trial finding in November, then it turns out that the Justice Department was like uh, issuing grants, uh, jury subpoenas against Nicola and its founders and everything else, right? So this is just a typical story illustrative of it. Um, I don't know if I have a, a clicker. So roughly the purple line is where the, um, where the report was issued. And you know, you see a big decline and then here's where the you know, the company says like, no, it's not true. And then here the chairman just steps down and things go badly, right? So we do observe a big decline at the beginning. And then you subsequently, the price just goes lower and lower for a while. So this is just uh, obviously just one example, but it's a typical behavior for a lot of companies we observe in the reports. Uh, so just a little bit of text analysis. Uh, what we're stuck in is the mapping between the file names and the compass at length. So that's what we're not doing more. Uh, so what we're doing so far is just a brief, um, and what we have to work a lot more, uh, but anyways. So first, just we're going to just use dictionary methods, and then we just show that over 60% of the report contains like direct allegations of fraud or financial misconduct, like just plain letter. You know, this is not just a bad company. They're actually having like false, fake, fraud, earnings management, illegal, dubious, accusation, suspect, questionable, failed to disclose, pump the stock. Like these are the kind of phrases they're gonna use. And we document that the majority of the report um, uh, uses those. Uh, this is not an extensive list. So what we do afterwards is we're gonna fit a topic modeling. I will be brief with the topic modeling description, but um, basically topic modeling is a technique to automatically summarize what the reports are about. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give the computer a bunch of text and the computer is roughly gonna tell me what the texts are about and what percentage uh, of each text is allocated to each topic, right? Uh, technically, what we're doing is LDA. Uh, so each document will be a probability distribution over topics. So you know, each document will speak about different things. So each document will speak about earnings mismanagement or like fraud or uh, you know um, just the firm fundamentals maybe. Uh, and then each document is going to have varying proportion of those. And what LDA is going to do is automatically going to capture that. So each document is a probability distribution over topics. Each topic is a probability distribution over words. I was describing the exact same slide like uh, two years ago for a different paper. Uh, the topics are latent, so there's not an automatic name, but you can literally just uh, read the list of words associated with each topic, and I'm going to show you in a second. Um, so for example, this is like uh, what we, it's called topic two, because you know there's no label, and we call it like fraud. So it has. China, claim, Chinese party, make fraud, chairman, own, et cetera, right? So just the list of words associated with, the, with each kind of document. Uh, we also have, for example, the earnings, earnings and guidance. So they also speak about fundamental in the things like revenue, growth, acquisition, sale, management, like some like reasonable things that are not related to fraud. What LDA does is like they, it identifies this topic automatically and it tells you for each document what's the proportion that they're allocating to each uh, part. Um, so that's the part where we have to do a little bit more of it. Uh, future's looking bright, but we haven't uh, seen it like thoroughly. The punchline here is like oh, the documents spend on average over 80% just discussing like uh, earnings fraud and mismanagement. So the one that I showed you is very representative. Most of these things are just like, you know, the company is a lie. Not only, not only is a, it's a bad company, it's also like fraud, right? Um, just a little bit about what kind of like uh, firm uh, our target. So roughly this, so there, everything is endogenous here. So this is definitely not a corporate finance paper uh, because the short seller uh, research companies are, target, are targeting very specific kind of firms. So it's usually younger firms, 
uh, that issue more stock, especially recently, that have like had had a very high returns lately. So like kind of like a, have been suffering from a momentum effect lately. Uh, they have high profitability, at least in the books, high real investment, uh, kind of like growth firms, um, and so on. So you know, this edge is in months, so uh, 80 months less than the average uh, company. They are just larger. They have had higher returns, higher net stock issuance, higher gross profitability, uh, low return over assets. So that's uh, interesting there. I uh, think they're uh, low book to market, um, et cetera. Uh, so first, just quickly, the, the, the price impact. So at, we're, here we're just plotting the whole distribution of the, of the abnormal returns on the dates of the short seller research report. So the distribution is like, you know, very, very much negative. Uh, there's like very, very large. And occasionally, the research report will target things like Tesla or something where it doesn't really work. So you also observe a little bit of, of positive. But the net impact is roughly like uh, 4 to 8% uh, on the very first day. Uh, and then it just keeps going afterwards, right? So the, if you just look at this uh, company's cumulative abnormal returns, so up to, up to until they, they have been growing a lot. So this is you know above and beyond what you would expect if they were just behaving like the market. They're roughly like 40% larger. And then the, um, the event happens, and then they just keep declining for you know uh, almost almost two years. So it, it's it's kind of weird because. You would expect this report to have a very short like impact. Like you would expect this, you know, I publish a report, I tell you Nikola is like a crappy company, and then the stock price just immediately goes down. We're gonna find that's not the case. For some reason, it takes uh, analysts, which we're gonna use as a proxy for the market, uh, cash flow expectations, a lot of time to adjust. Yeah. Uh, so it's 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 kind of weird because obviously this. Uh, this should be kind of like cash flow shocks, at least in my mind, that was like my first thing. Like, you know, this is just telling you it's a crappy company, so this should be a cash flow shocks, and then I should just decrease my expectation about it. Uh, what we're gonna find is that people do not decrease their expectation about it, so it's gonna behave more like a discount rate shock, which is weird because these things are very idiosyncratic. Uh, so what we're gonna do is like, if you just think about a, you know, Gordon growth model, we can decompose into the cash flow part, the discount rate part, and the growth part, right? So. In my mind, this was all cash flow or growth, if you want to think about it. Um, yeah, so what we're going to have is, uh, because we have IBS data, so that's data for the analyst expectations about dividends and data about the prices and you know the current price today, we can actually see what are the changes in the expected returns. So roughly before the, before the report, like you know, there's like no real effects, and afterwards, in analysts' minds, the decline is like so large that it's gonna mean revert. So it, it's very funny that analysts are actually expecting a higher expected return following this kind of, of announcements. And it's very funny because it doesn't work that way. Like in practice, it just keeps going down and down. But if you just look at analyst expectations from IBS, uh, you're gonna think that these companies are very, very um, uh, well, uh, good investments going forward, or they're riskier for unrelated reasons. Now, what hap what's happening with the cash flows is that it just takes a lot of time to adjust. So, you know, the, the full adjustment comes like 12 uh, months after the company's uh, report is released to the public. So that's going to be a little bit, you know, problematic because then you have that the cash flow expectations are going like uh, too slow. The, you have a huge price decline, so you have higher expected returns. What we're going to say that, and this is the controversial part, is that the essentially the high expected return is working as uh, increasing the implied cost of capital, right? That's the mechanical part, and the implied cost of capital is going to prevent this company from like doing things like stock issuance. Like in practice, it just means that you know my stock price declined a lot. Uh, the market is not going to believe me anymore if I continue doing the same stock issuance. And remember, these companies used to have higher stock issuance uh, relative to their peers, right? And we're going to say like hopefully this also will decrease their investment. Uh, you know, because a higher cost of capital should automatically trans translate into that. And we also uh, observe things like uh, debt issuance and things like that. Um, it, it's funny because if, if we just look at the long-term earnings growth expectations, we do observe like a, you know, decline. Again, slowly, like it takes like 12 months to realize, but the short-term cash flow somehow in analyst minds are just going to mean revert. Uh, have another paper where we say like, you know, analysts are not that great and we've seen like another paper here. So 
it may or may not come as a surprise, but uh, the problem is that uh, in practice, it's just going to behave weirdly. Uh, we do observe eventually the change in realized earnings on equity and assets. So most of these reports on average are correct. Like, you know, when they say the company was like, just faking the video of the truck and the truck's not gonna work. Like it's, it's, it's most likely true. So we do observe a very significant decline, like 20% return on equity, 6% uh, uh, decline in return on assets. So it's the reports are being correct on average, right? It's just analysts are just taking too long to update their expectations. We have the same thing in you know, gross profitability to assets, another 8% decline like going forward. The effect seems to last a long time. We think it lasts a long time because the expectations are not pricing correctly at the first time. So what we're going to do is we're just going to use a standard uh, implied cost of capital model. We have the, uh, lucky for us, we have analyst expectations regarding cash flows going forward. Uh, we have the price today, so we can back out what's the discount rate, right? You would expect that this to be a pure cash flow effects and the price to just decline because of that. But in practice, because the cash flow expectations are very, very stable, it's going to be as if there is an increased cost of capital. Uh, so there is the increased cost of capital, and it just keeps going higher, like for uh, for uh, for a couple of uh, years. Yeah. Uh, of of course, if we just run the regressions instead of the table, it works. Uh, we're not doing anything weird, I hope. But you know, the the picture is is more illustrative for the for the presentation. And we observe like this impact is just going to be permanently higher, at least until the four years. Thanks. Uh, we're uh, we're using four years because. Um, we, uh, you know, the, the data only started in like 20, uh, 2000 something, so we don't, we don't have that much uh, sample. Uh, yeah. Uh, we observe a huge decline on the net stock issuance, which is good. Like this company shouldn't be issuing a uh, stock. So like it's like roughly 6%. Uh, and because these companies are larger on average, that's going to be like 100 million uh, per report. Um, again, the decline happens slowly, presumably because Investors are not incorporating the, the, the information so quickly as they should. Uh, we do observe a huge decline in investment of assets as well. So this is roughly like 60% uh, at the four years. Uh, we think it's important to mention that this is a very slow process. Like if you look at the year one or two, like it, it doesn't capture the, the full effect of the magnitude. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's very interesting because it's a story about like a very short term information impacting the long-term um, activities of the firm. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, this is obviously robust if we measure it, uh, whether it's investment or, or uh, changes in capital and R&D expenditures, uh, or I, I think we have, you know. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, this is actually a real effect. So we do observe that the company is targeted, you know, their sales decreased like, 40, the sales growth decreased like 40% uh, amongst four years. Um, uh, obviously, the the results go through. If uh, if we if we use um, if we use uh, regressions, so the the only concern for us is that all of this um, everything is endogenous and endogenous, right? Like the 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 firm's uh, activities are going to be endogenous. The fact that the specific research uh, company uh, targets someone is going to be endogenous. The way the price response is going to be endogenous. So we're not we're trying to purposely abstain from any causality statement just because we, we do not know that uh, we can control for things. So, you know, we do the typical things that we can do. We do like uh, firm fix effects, zero fix effects, a bunch of controls, whatever you can imagine, and we observe that the effect is there. Uh, but th there is no way this have a casual interpretation because, you know, everything is endogenous and endogenous, and we're trying to be very positive about it. But we do think that the... Um, Magnitudes are large enough that uh, it would be a wonderful coincidence uh, if you know if it just happened to decline like 60% investment uh, over assets uh, changes. If 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 it was not uh, like this, the most we can do is uh, we come up with a comparison group. That's those are the companies that are exposed, revealed to have committed fraud um, in the in the eyes of the SEC. The, we have a database for that. And uh, compared ag uh, against, you know, the ones that have the reports, and you know, the findings that we observe is that for the companies that committed fraud but are not like publicly displayed for that, we do not observe like this kind of impacts. So we only observe this kind of impacts for the companies that uh, are released by the short seller research report. 
Now, uh, th there's only so much we can do uh, to control for endogeneity, but you know, I, I couldn't think of an alternative story. Yeah, so I'm just gonna conclude quickly also to catch up. So firm mentions in short sale research reports significantly reduce the real investment and stock issuance, right? The average reduction is uh, 118 million and the average stock issuance reduction is 180 million. So these are not peanuts. Like the, the every single report has lots of, um, lots of effect. And just like talking, uh, with people in the industry, they do tell us that that's what they observe. Like, in fact, they were like, like maybe, you know, may maybe it should be higher than that, but uh, everyone uh, is overconfident on their own ability. Uh, these reports are going to allocate a large percentage of the text commenting on fraud and earnings mismanagement. The target firms earn up normal returns of minus 4% on the publication day, and then the effect keeps going longer, like to minus 8 in the 12 uh, month horizon. But the problem is like the cash flow expectation decreases like even like more sluggishly, so that increases the cost of capital. So you know, counterintuitively, when you release a report of the company, the cash flow expectations are larger, um, which we think is driving the um, is, di is driving the decrease in the stock issuances, and it's driving the decrease in the um, uh, real investment. Yeah, and the things to do going forward is we're, we just have to take more seriously the text analysis part. So we want to do you know like. If you mention specifically investment in the in the in the short sale report, maybe that will have like a more material impact. In, or if you're just saying like you know this company is fraud because they're faking something, like maybe that will have a more material impact than if you're just saying this company is uh, badly managed. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So Leandro and the discussion for the paper is Matthew Ringenberg for from the University of Utah. Sure. Okay, well, well, they get that ready. Let me just provide a little bit of background because I think it'll be helpful context for what I'm going to say. Um, so those of you who know me, my research all looks at the role of institutional investors. And early on, a lot of my work looked at the role of short sellers in secondary markets. And there is now a very large literature on short sellers in secondary markets. And it's one of those few places, I think, in academic research where I think there's largely a consensus that has emerged. So what you see in this literature is when there's high short selling, it predicts low future returns. And that's true in the cross section. That's true in the time series. That suggests that short sellers are skilled. Why? Again, they are selecting stocks that do predictably worse in the future. OK, so why do I bring this up? Well, that's, that's kind of the old literature. More recently, the literature has started kind of shifting into an important area. Instead of just looking at secondary market effects, the literature has started asking, are there real effects? Does it matter for the economy more generally? And instead of just looking at selection effects, it has now started to think about, are there treatment effects from short selling as well? And so when I think about this paper, I think it is now adding a very important thing to this literature, right? We're going to think about whether or not the research reports issued by short sellers matter for the economy. Does it change firm behavior? Uh, and so I, I knew there would be a, a nice presentation on this, so I, I won't really summarize the paper. You know, but the big results, these short seller research reports come out, the stock price falls, there's a higher cost of capital, lower stock issuance, and then you see lower future investment. So, it seems like short sellers do have this impact on firm behavior. Now, I have a, a, just a couple of kind of big picture comments that, that I think are pretty um, quick to address. You know, for sure, this is an incredibly important topic. I mean, I think, uh, I don't know, some, some of us, as, as we get older, we have these existential crises. My own existential crises was starting to think about, does any of the research we do matter for the world? Uh, and, and, and if you think about that, kind of, well, one of the ways it seems like it really might matter is if we can actually show a connection between secondary market activity and the real economy. Uh, so super important question, no qualms about that. Um, the paper, I think, is admittedly still pretty early, so the text is rough. That's fine. They'll fix all of those things. Um, but I do have some comments that I think are addressable. And it's going to be the normal identification one, some discussion about contribution, and some minor econometric things. Uh, but let me start off with the identification. So like I said, I think there is a very large literature showing selection effects from short selling. 
the authors kind of have intentionally tried to you know, shy away from any sort of causality statement. So there was a bunch of these uh, sentences. I picked one. We shy away from causality statements. Uh, but again, if you really think about this, I, I, I think you just you have to take this one head on. Why? Because this is where the paper has the most potential. We already know there are selection effects from short sellers. They pick stocks that are worse. What I really want to know is, are there treatment effects too? Uh, and so what we're really asking is, what would have happened to these firms absent the short sellers report? And that seems like the key question. And I suspect most of us are on your side. I think we mostly think these reports are changing firm behavior. Um, but I think it really is important to be able to show that it is the report that is somehow the causal event here. And so to do that, you're going to just have to think a lot, hard about, a lot harder about the counterfactual. right? What would have happened had these reports not been issued? And I guess the subset of us who are older than 40 will remember Enron. Um, what you guys might not remember is how we learned about Enron. We learned about Enron because a very famous short seller named Jim Chanos took a short position and then wrote about it. And so again, what I think the real question, as I read this paper that I, that I just kept thinking about over and over and over again, is we know when, when something like an Enron happens, a ton of wealth was destroyed. The real question is, if Jim Chanos hadn't written that report, would there have been more wealth destroyed? Right? Because if so, right, then we're finding that short sellers are just incredibly important for the economy. And so again, what I really want to think about is what happens right, as the counterfactual. And I think you guys can do that. And, and this is kind of my second comment too. right? It's, it's pretty closely related. So there is, I mean, I, again, I don't want to make it seem like this, this paper doesn't have a contribution. There are almost no papers looking at this topic, right? which is in contrast to most of, of the literatures out there. But there is kind of one related paper. Uh, Wang and Zhao have this working paper where they show that activist short sale campa campaigns do have some real effects. Um, and they just kind of show, on average, these campaigns look like they're changing firm behavior. Uh, but again, where I think this paper could really drastically change our understanding in the literature is by trying to think about that counterfactual. If you could show us kind of two things. One, the short sale report itself is changing firm behavior. That would be amazing. Two, again, like I said, what I really want to know is kind of then what are the implications for that? So absent these reports, what would have happened? Are the short sellers basically preventing a bunch of wealth from being destroyed? Is this efficient right? when they write these reports? And that's the thing. I mean, I have a strong prior on this. I, I bet a lot of you do. But we don't actually know. And, and so that's where if you guys could say something about that, suddenly this is an incredibly important finding. Uh, and so I would kind of push you, you know, to, to think more about the counterfactual and then try to show us whether or not the release of these reports is improving efficiency, right, by just preventing all this wealth from being destroyed in the economy. Um, that, th then, then, I mean, that, those are kind of my two big comments. I think the paper is very close to that. But if it could do those things, it would be truly amazing. Um, I also have just, I don't know, minor econometric quibbles. Not, none of it is that big. But again, one of them is kind of related to my other two comments, which is uh, right at the end, he mentioned they do this analysis where they look at firms that are eventually identified as having committed accounting fraud, but there's no short seller report. And this is where, again, I think you need to do a ton more analysis on this database. And one of the things I found myself noticing was if you looked at that table where they look at do firms that have accounting fraud but no short seller report have real effects, what you'll see is there were a lot of negative point estimates, but nothing was statistically significant. And of course, I mean, this is probably a good thing, the sample of firms that have accounting fraud and short sellers don't identify it is pretty small. I think there were 85 examples. So then, of course, you start thinking, well, maybe this is just a power issue. And so again, I think you need to, you know, the, the burden is really to show that that subset of firms is very different from the ones with short sellers, right? So that we can understand what is the causal impact of short selling. So I would be remiss if I didn't have a gratuitous self cite Some of my recent papers have tried to push non-results, which is uh, an exercise in getting punched in the face a lot. Um, 
But when we do this, one of the things I've learned that helps readers kind of understand non-results is we've started presenting minimum detectable effect sizes. So I would, I would add this, right? Tell us whether it really is there's no result versus your test just couldn't, couldn't find it, right? Um, I have other minor little things about kind of interpreting economic magnitudes. I also think uh, some of your specifications kind of look like a dynamic diff and diff. Um, I'd like to see pre-period dummies too, right? Just to see a little bit more. But these are all really minor comments. Uh, you know, there's really nothing that major other than kind of the identification aspect and thinking harder about that counterfactual and whether or not this is economically efficient, right? Releasing these reports is preventing wealth from being destroyed. Um, but overall, I think again, the topic just matters so much that that's that's you know that's what gets me excited, uh, and I think the authors can address all this. I know that counterfactual won't be easy, but I think you guys can do it, right? And and that's what would elevate this to an incredibly important result. Um, but I will uh, I will end there. Thank you. Uh, all right, so I guess. We we have time, so if you want to get back first, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for the wonderful discussion. I think it was perfect. Uh, I think we definitely need to to address these things. Um, yeah, I I was shying away from uh, identification assumptions just because in my mind everything's endogenous and endogenous. But you know, if if, if I think I think it's taking a more serious look to see if we can find like you know, at least taking the exercise more seriously. Like, you know, it was just, I just saw like it was a table at the end and in the presentation I didn't even put the table because I wasn't also sure about the statistical issues. So we'll definitely, we'll definitely take this seriously. And yeah, I, I, I think everyone has the same priors that, you know, these things are released and then something changes. And obviously the, the big issue in our mind is that, well, we do not observe the world where these things are not issued or maybe those are the frauds company, but maybe they're different. Uh, so we'll definitely try all of the all of your suggestions, and um, yeah, it's still a very early, so don't even read the draft yet. We'll we'll, we'll update it. Uh, we'll update it at some point after after gathering comments. Uh, but yeah, um, I, I I agree with everything. And Other questions? Yeah. Thanks, Ray. Is it on? Hello. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if I can use this to think about how these short sales are making strategic disclosures as opposed to just you know, looking at the topic model. Because, you know, they're, they are, they're maximizing their own profit. And if, you, if you've discovered something wrong and then you take a short position, the optimal strategy is probably to make you make the company look as bad as possible, subject to not getting sued, right? So maybe the reason that you're seeing so much weight on the fraud topic is because that's how you get attention. That's how you make people really doubt this company if you insinuate fraud. And so I'm wondering if you can somehow back out those incentives. And I'm also wondering whether it has something to do with the sluggish response of cash flow expectations. Because if, if I'm hearing somebody going fraud, 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 you know, and I know they have an incentive to shout really loud, maybe I, as a Bayesian, I don't put that much weight on it, my expectations are just slowly. And I'm wondering if you, if you could identify that mechanism, that would be really cool. Yeah, so what we can definitely do and will do is uh, we can explore what kind of strategies lead to a greater decrease in stock price, right? Because that's what uh, the short seller uh, research uh, companies are maximizing, how much the, the, the price decline. Uh, so what we'll be able to do is uh, to characterize, you know, whether you mentioned more of these things, uh, that's a very good suggestion, so we'll do it. Uh, you know, what kind of style just maximizes this and what kind of style just takes longer to accumulate and all of those, all of those issues, yeah. So that's, that's definitely in our radar. So I actually have a question really to answer about this cash flow expectation part. And most of these companies are either young, small, and, and the question is how reliable are these cash flow expectations for this company, right? So it must not be the case that a slow adjusting that might be off because there's a lot of uncertainty around it. So when you do this decomposition of expected on cash flow, might be the case that you're not actually picking up the proper expectation of cash flow. So that's an issue, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're definitely assuming, you know, we only have data for the analyst expectations and minor risk expectations. So that that's what we're using uh, re regarding cash flows. Uh, I do think that expectations are obviously wrong, uh, but I don't know if it's obvious ex ante that they're wrong uh, about those specific subsets. So you know, we 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 can do the so controlling for observables is like fine and nothing changes. Controlling for like whether there's something very specific about these companies that I cannot know and also only the short sale research. Uh, company knows uh, th th that's going to be trickier. Uh, so at some point, 
Yeah, uh, we, we can definitely think harder about it, and we're happy to control for as many expectations as possible. At some point, I thought like maybe we can just have like a machine learning kind of expectation embedded and see the comparison. But that, that's already I, I, we already did that in the other paper. So, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a good suggestion. Um, I think it could be helpful for your identification if you look at spillovers to firms that share the same buzzword. So, for example, when one of the Chinese company was issued a short seller report uh, by those institutes, and then a lot of Chinese firms are under pressure because people were suspecting that uh, those are all subject to the same fraud. So then you could have some uh, variation in terms of managers who believe that uh, they do not uh, have fraud versus those who might be uh, problematic, then you can look at the real effects of those people, oh, th uh, sorry, of those firms, to, disting uh, to distinguish where the causal effect comes from. Okay, I love that suggestion. Uh, we're definitely gonna try that. Uh, yeah, I think it's a wonderful idea. Yeah. Uh, last question, I guess, here. Unless someone answers. Thank you so much for the presentation, Kanto. Uh, have you thought about using different topic modelings? Because one of the disadvantages of LEA is that maybe two companies or two reports, sorry, are talking about the same fraud but using different type of words, which you can control, for example, structuring topic modeling or other concepts. Yeah, no, I I, I think uh, there's a lot more to be done uh, regarding the the topic models, and yeah, we can definitely like incorporate like some characteristics of the text, like do a little bit more serious on the. On a sentiment analysis, try to come up with measures of like you know what's the what's the best kind of way to speak about it in order to maximize uh, to maximize the, the word they're talking. I mean, uh, all of this. I, I know the language looks like very like fraud, 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 fraud. But you know, like these companies do this for a living. So I, at some point, I'm gonna guess there's like some internal optimization in in how they they, they handle the 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 reports. But we'll we'll definitely be happy to to do more for that.